All right. Uh, yeah, as was previously mentioned, my name is Kano. I'm a student over at Harvard, and I've been doing some uh, work on Julia, particularly in porting it to Windows, and um, as part of that, also doing a basic rewrite of some of the I/O system that we have in Julia. And I'm just going to give you a few examples. What I'm going to talk about here is not an exhaustive overview of what we have in terms of the new I/O system, but I'm just going to show off a few cool features that we can now do in Julia and maybe give one neat example that I think um, is particularly instructive. So um, let's get started. Basically, in Julia now, everything, um, uh, there's this new object, which is a stream. And uh, most uh, objects, most I.O. objects you will interact with are actually asynchronous I.O. streams. We do this using libuv. For example, I just did stand it in, and that's a um, that's a TTY, and uh, as you can see, it says it's connected to currently our terminal and um, doesn't have any bytes waiting. And um, you can do a you can do a, a whole bunch of stuff with the stream, and basically for every stream, the API is the same. But um, so we have this uh, we have the standard in stream, and um, just as bef as before, we merged the new I/O stuff. You would just use synchronous methods on this I.O. stream, and you can still do that. So for example, if I do write standard out, uh, hello world, um, it'll uh, write hello world to standard out, and then the 11 you see is the, is the number of bytes written. So these, all these synchronous I.O. methods you're used to will still work. And also, um, can we change the color of the output? Of the, of the output? Yeah. What would you like to change it to? Well, I, I, very often on Windows, I have a black background, and the output is blue, and I can't really read it. Was yeah, I, I think. Uh, I think it's JL answer underscore answer color. Is, is it JL answer color? I'm pretty sure. All right. And I'll that should work. Yeah. Now I believe. Yeah. Now the answer color is black instead of blue. Well, anyway, so um, we have a synchronous write methods. We obviously also have synchronous reads. Uh, for example, uh, you could read a line from standard in. Uh, uh, that would just work. And um, that's basically your standard synchronous I/O interface. And there's a bunch of other methods. But the real, the real fun is basically is really in the um, in the asynchronous I/O, and also um, some of the high-performance stuff you can do. Right now, the interface is not the most performant uh, at the moment. We have to do some optimization of some code path, but it's uh, the basic stuff is basically there. And um, I'll show off a bit of um, what we can do. For example, um, we also now have uh, TCP sockets. So a TCP socket is the type just typing TCP socket will create a disconnected uh, disconnected TCP socket. You can do most of what you would do with a TCP socket in raw C. So for example, um, you could technically now call the bind method and the listen method, or you could call the connect method. Um, usually, you don't want to do that. We have a much nicer API for doing stuff like that. For example, um, say I wanted to create a server on port 2000, then um, we have the open any TCP port method, which basically you give it a port hint. Um, uh, and then you can also specify the callback directly here. Normally, you would have to specify the callback in the socket object. So um, I don't know if you know, but asynchronous I.O. is mostly based on callbacks and event, uh, um, event handling. So this is how you would specify a callback. So for example, Yes. So um, this gave us um, a. It returned the port that it actually connected to. So, for example, if port two thousand would be uh, were busy, this would try to connect to port two thousand one, port two thousand two, and stuff like that. Uh, this is basically how we do the opening of TCP sockets in the in the parallel worker. So, if you start a worker remotely, it'll first try port nine thousand and port nine thousand one, or uh, I think it starts nine thousand ten. 
not quite sure. But anyway, this is it. It basically this function just tries a bunch of available ports and gives you which one is available. It's a convenience methods. We have we have a few others. Um, we'll iterate on the API a bit, but this is essentially how it'll work. So if I now uh, try to connect to that, that will work. Um, so as you can see, I just used netcat to connect to localhost on port 2000, and I, uh, the callback got called in Julia um, that I specified on the openmany TCP port <coughs> method. Um, and that's how we do um, TCP sockets, basically. I can also show um, just quickly that it also works the other way. And now that we... Um, can you pass this to a read line and we'll be able to read a line from the socket? Uh, yeah, I could. Um, then can you... Yeah, uh, let, me, let, me, let me do that. So uh, actually, let me do it the other way. Because if you open a server in Julia, you have to handle accept correctly. And take the callback that I specified technically gets the socket of the, of the client pass in as, a, as an argument to the callback, but I just disregarded that, so I can't do that right now. But let me actually, um, uh, let me close. Um, oh, yeah, that is old, but anyway. Forgot to assign the socket to anything, so I can't actually close it at the moment. <laughs> but um, let me just close the entire program. That'll kill the socket. Um, CD Julia. CD. Is that the right directory? Yes. All right. So uh, let me actually open a, a server in Natcat, so I don't have to deal with all the server client I on the Julia side, and let Natcat deal with that. Uh, it all works in Julia, but for the purpose of this demo, handling servers might be a little too much. But so, um, uh, so you said you want to connect it to Readline. Yeah, we could do that. Or, so, or maybe I mean I was just trying to see if it's yeah, we, the we same can, as any other. Yeah, it's uh, it is. Um, Readline does a bit of special stuff with right. that only works on TTYs. You could probably make it work. How about we write? Uh, you open up and write, and then it shows up at Netcat. In, in yeah, well, we can. Yeah, easier? yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll do. A, I'll, I'll try a bit of stuff. So let's say um, um, there's the connect to host method, which also does. Um, so I don't know if you know how the Unix API works, but localhost is a host name, so you need to do DNS resolution. The connect to um, connect to host method will do that for you. Um, you could also specify the IP address numerically, and you wouldn't have to do that. But um, this will do that. Um, so I guess we're not exporting that. Uh, did I misspell that? Oh, yeah, that takes a UN16. That's what it is. We're, we need to work on this networking API. This we do. It's this fixed. Is, this is not Kino's fault. No, it's he, he inherited an API. Re implemented everything underneath. Yeah. Yeah, the, the connect to host method is one that was used in the web REPL, so I didn't actually change the API of it. Um, but yeah, the, all the, the, the type API is much nicer. For example, I can now do. Uh, you may want to save that. To yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I was just going to do that. So I can now, I can now uh, write stuff to the socket just as before as we did. Uh, as we did with the uh, with standard in, so this will work and uh, so just I don't know if you guys noticed, but that showed up on the next oh, yeah. side. <laughs> it's up here, so uh, this will work as well. Uh, I don't know. So you you can do you can do stuff like that and. Um, so uh, this, but this is again the uh, synchronous API. So um, let's do something a little more, a little more fancy with this. So um, let's use the asynchronous API. So uh, so let, let's let's write a callback. So the the, the read callback, uh, the read a read callback gets the stream uh, the number of bytes read. Um, 
And let's say, all right, let's, uh, let's say we want the input as a string. So we, we do that, and then we uh, do take buff string of the buffer. As, as, as I said, the, or as Stefan also mentioned, we need to work on this API, but uh, this is basically how it is, how it is right now. Um, and let's see, we can do all kinds of stuff with the, uh, with the string now, but Viral mentioned he wanted to hook it up to readline, and readline, as I said, is a bit, is a bit tricky, but we can, we can probably make it work that it evaluates expressions as, as if they were inter entered into the REPL. So um, let's see, if I just did, uh, don't try this at home, but, um, and then, This is something I also remarked yesterday. The REPL channel basically works with um, um, remote refs. So that's why, and that's what I'm doing here. I'm writing the AST that I'm getting. Um, uh, I'm writing that to the remote ref that represents the REPL. So uh, let's see if I did. Yeah. So this works, and now now for the next for my next trick, so to speak. Uh, well, it it just does it as if it works. <laughs> It just does it as if it were executed inside the REPL. So uh, you can access the objects that are local to the REPL. Uh, yeah, that's what I just accessed from the remote connection, since I'm basically just pushing expression onto the stack to be executed by the REPL. Wow. So. Uh, so this seems like it would make it really easy to build something where you could, you know, pass off the control, like make a different node that's communicating and process yeah. the, the node you're talking to currently. Yeah, that's very easy. very easy. I think it would be cool to have this whole thing in an IRC session. That works. I can I can do that. <laughs> what, so you can evaluate so, Julia code in IRC? Yeah, so you're on the Julia IRC channel and you're talking about some code and you try it out and, and it just gets evaluated. <laughs> you right do there. like dot eval and then Mm. Some syntax, yeah. <laughs> It'll probably take about 40 lines of code once we have an ISC interface to make that possible. Wow. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, th so this, is, this is basically um, Julia's new asynchronous I.O. A little bit of uh, API refactoring needs to be done, a little bit of performance tweaking. Um, but basically, this is how it works. Oh, I can... And a little bit of documentation, I guess. Yeah, um, <laughs> we, yeah a little bit of documentation. <laughs> but... Um, we can also do, I, I almost forgot, there's an entire big chunk of this new API that, is, um, that deals with process spawning and stuff like that. So uh, let, me, let me show that, that off real quick uh, as well. Um, I'm just going to pop it there. I don't. <laughs> so uh, redirection, redirection to streams works. So we just redirected the output from git status to the socket, and we wrote all of that from the socket to Julia. So, um, yeah. And this works on all platforms? Right? This works on all platforms. You can do this on Windows. Um, parallel stuff works on our platforms. You can also add a Linux worker from Windows um, if you really felt like doing something that masochistic. But, um, yeah, so this is... Um, this is Julia's new I.O. API. Um, I'm quite excited about it. Um, and I think if we change the API <coughs> a little bit, we'll, do, we'll be able to do some amazing stuff. All right, uh, any questions about anything I showed or? Is it any documentation like that at all? Um, <laughs> there is some. I, I, I wrote up a seven page um, thing about a, a basic introduction is currently not published anywhere. Um, I think we should put it up on the blog or something. We'll, we'll clean it up. 
we'll we'll clean this up over the next week. Uh, yeah, a better API with a better API, a good blog post would kind of blow people's minds. I mean, that thing you did with the writing, I don't know, you made my head explode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't, I, I came up with that example in the five minutes before this presentation, so this is really easy to do in Julia. There's not, no pitfalls. It's not that I had to change anything in Julia. And uh, Viral mentioned about Readline. You could also hook this thing up to Readline, but Readline does a few tricks specific to TTYs, so that would require some core changes, but I wanted to show that you really don't need to modify base Julia to do any other stuff. So um, this is how that works. Awesome. So Ian, oh, sorry, <laughs> I meant to say, Ian, to answer your question about the documentation, you could always come hang out with us anytime. Yeah. <laughs> over the next week before we document it. So. Yeah. So I mean, do you think it's going to change like the function names? Like. Yeah, pretty much. Um, the the backend the backend is pretty much in place. It currently uses a bunch of C wrappers that I hope to get rid of uh, when merging Jameson's new patch that will allow us to call C structs directly uh, or pass C structs around directly. Uh, they'll make the, the, uh, the back end API a lot cleaner. The front end API will probably names will change and we'll add a few more functions to make it easier to modify these TCP socket objects. Um, of course, the TCP socket isn't the only one. We have UDP sockets, which probably work. Uh, I haven't tried it. But, uh, so, I mean, my understanding of uh, libuv is that it, a, lot, a lot of it comes back to what what Baral was talking about, that it sort of makes, provides a uniform interface over things like sockets and yes. I/O I handles. And, yes. Yeah, that's very nice. Yeah, this, 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 as I said, the, the same, the same example would work unmodified on Windows. Right. Well, I, I didn't. I mean, that you know, you can treat I/O handles and socket handles very similarly, more similarly than you can even in just pure Unix. Yeah, yeah, this, this yeah, is... That's, that's really the, that's the coolest yeah. thing about this. Yeah. Yeah. And across, and you can do it on Windows, which is like... Right, it would, and it works on Windows, too, which is completely Julia insane. the operating system. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, impressive stuff. That's great. Bye. All right. All right.